What's going on? How we doing? Well, on my age, nothing much is going on. I'm doing fine. Okay. Oops, I'm on mute. All right. Who's on mute? I, have a, I was a on small mute. Question. Oh, you were on mute. Okay. All right. Well, you guys, you hello, guys. Miss hello, Miss Hello, hello, hello. Hey, how you doing? Uh, you guys hey, are having hey. uh, your own early meetings, aren't you? Try. Okay. <laughs> well, that's fine. You know, that's fine. You got well, you know, sometimes, Charles, sometimes we need to say something that uh, is no proper for your ear, so. I know. You told me that last <laughs> week, you know. And that's okay. You, you can talk about me, you know, either behind my back or to my face. It doesn't matter. It, it's fine. I'm all right with it. It's it's fine. You know, it's better than being ignored, I guess. Right? Uh, yeah. Yep. So anyway, uh, you guys ready to get started? Ready when you yeah. are. Okay, good. Because uh, we've got a little bit of work, not a lot to cover. And then um, if, if we go through this rather quickly, uh, I may play a video by an artist by the name of uh, John Crump, who... Uh, is talking a little bit about doing studies, uh, like little plein air studies, uh, you know, actually out in the field to begin to figure out, you know, how, you know, how you want to compose things, crop things, uh, you know, to get, to get a, a really decent painting out of it. So uh, we may look at that as well. Uh, other than that, uh, I got a question. I sent out an email this morning with links did yes, everybody, okay. it's working. Did everyone get those? Yeah, that's it. what I use now. Yes, yeah. it's working. Okay. Is there is there anyone here who did not get an email from me? Okay, I'll take that as a a no. Okay, all right, which is good because I I you know I tried to send it out to everybody, and again you know I sent out there's a. I guess a couple of workshops coming up at uh, Bowden or through Bowden on Zoom. Um, you know, that would be worth looking at. I mean, they're not art related, but you know, they certainly have to deal with things, you know, in life that most of us probably need to take a little time and, and look at. Um, I know I do, <clears throat> but, uh, but they've got some things going on and, uh, and then of course we've got all the classes and, and I sent the links, the newest, latest, greatest links from uh, Sabrina and Fulton County. And then I went ahead and copied links into the email for me so that you guys have it. Uh, and again, I'm probably pre preaching to the choir, but save it, put it aside, you know, put it in a folder by itself, whatever, so you can get to it in case you need to, um, you know, in, in a hurry. And that will simplify life for you, we hope. Okay, so on that happy note, let's get rolling. So we're gonna look at uh, the work that got sent in. And we're gonna start uh, by talking about Bob. Um, what, about Bob? <laughs> what about Bob? What about Bob? <laughs> what about Bob? Well. <laughs> Bob sent us in. Is he selling photographs? Um, well, let's let Bob explain, you know, what, you know, what, what the idea of sending us in was. Bob, you want to explain why you sent this to us? Well, because we are of the uh, nature of being a little more senior citizens than most, lucky us. Yeah. And, and I have been playing records recently, and this was a record sleeve. Uh, that was in a, I don't remember what record it was, but this was, this was about 1963 is when this uh, yeah, album was cut. And this was, this was top rate technology in 1963. And I thought everybody might like to, you know, s see what was. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Take a look at it. Yeah. I know that's like the latest and greatest, you know, it's like you have these separate speakers that attach to your phonographs, you know, and yeah. things like that. I know that was cool stuff back then, wasn't it? Yep. I will remember. That's pressure hi fi stereo. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and just looking at the size of the arm 
and the uh, the size of the disc in the center. Um, you know, this would play either what was it, thirty threes or forty fives, and maybe even seventy eights. Oh, yeah, maybe maybe seventy eights. Yeah. Uh, now seventy eights were even bigger, right? Yes, well, seventy eights were somewhere between forty fives and thirty threes. Oh, they were uh, sideways. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because they were they were big and heavy mm -hmm. and thick. Yeah. Unbreakable. Yeah. And breakable, yes, and very and break breakable. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing um there were like some oversized albums that they had mastered in like blue transparent, you know, plastic or you know, whatever uh, they made, yes. vinyl, I guess. And uh, you know, I, I thought those were seventy eights, but they seem bigger to me than 33s. Yeah, they, they, they've become more popular now. Basically, there's okay. a lot of vinyl that's coming back into vogue. Oh, uh, yeah. And they're doing it in all shades and manner. And, you know, you could, you could get lessons in, in paint colors by just looking at the albums. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, they're, they're, for those people who are audiophiles, um, you know, there's something to be said for listening to a recording on a record versus a digital copy and you know one would think that you know a digital copy would actually have better sound but that's not actually true uh actually actually the the record itself actually has a, a kind of a deeper and a wider range of of sound recorded on it than you can get out of a digital file it, it, it's called harmonics Mm -hmm. And and basically, it is analog versus digital. And analog is a continuous change, whereas digital is is step related. I mean, you you know, you do one step at a time. Whereas analog, you get all the in betweens of steps. Yeah. So th th there's now a difference. One, one question, Robert: Where can I find needle for the oh, online? Yeah, online. Uh, Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Just go to some place called the Needle you're Doctor. Gonna, you're going gonna to pay a pretty, pretty penny for it. Oh, yeah. Well, not, not really. There's, yeah, there's some, I mean, there, you're probably going to spend like about 20 bucks. Oh, you know? really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe a little bit more, but not much. Yeah, for the cartridge, you know, the because I, I have an old phonograph here, and I was looking at at getting a new needle for it. And it was probably about 20 bucks. That's just the cost of, of buying it. Which, then you have to pay for shipping. What is the address, needle.com? Yeah, try Needle Doctor. Try, try that online. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, have uh, my, I'm... I have my old turntable stereo. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm really upset. I got rid of my turntable and my vinyl collection before it came back to be popular again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I kind of did the same thing. I got rid of almost everything. Any, anything that was really worth any great amount of money, um, I got rid of by the yes, box. Uh, that's what I did, box bolts. <laughs> yeah. But that's okay. I'm, you know, I've got enough stuff laying around here that I've still probably got close to 200 records. So, you know, it's just, uh, it's endless. Anyway. Um, so let's, so thanks for that, you know, a blast from the past. Uh, and then of course you sent in, this is the assignment. And um, so tell it, you know, I, I recognize the reference that you used uh, to paint this from. Where, where are you gonna go from here? Um, I'm, I'm using Richard uh, Schmidt as, as my guide here. Okay. And uh, I've I finished watching the video so that I won't be able to be here uh, tomorrow. Oh, okay. Uh, but I finished watching the video and, and uh, trying to take some lessons from what he's, what he's done and how he do, does it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, experimentation is what we're after here. But okay. this is an interesting, the, 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 the panel is 28 by 22. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a free canvas. Right. Um, and and the the next the next picture you're going to show is what what the what was on the other side, and right. I looked the guy's name is is um, Peter Bell, and I looked him up and he's an artist from Orlando, and uh, it's a you know fairly nice painting, 
Uh, it, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of what they call it, um, canvas reproductions. No, it's, it's, it's G clay. G clay could be G clay, yeah. uh, but it's done on a canvas. Mm -hmm. Right. And, yeah. and, and, and so, so this, this is what I took out of the frame and I turned it over and bought some canvas and pasted it on the other side and I'm doing it. I'll have a dual painting. I can flip it over when I want to. <laughs> there you go. Right. Okay. Um, now, when I read your email, you know, um, I saw that you thought that that was an odd size canvas, but actually 22 by 28 is what you consider a portrait dimension canvas. Okay. And so you can actually buy frames standard uh, for those canvases. And there's, there's about eight different scaled sizes that are considered, you know, portrait dimension okay. uh, that don't fall into that, you know, average 1824, 1620, you know, it's two by three and three by four uh, dimensions. Um, but uh, you you can't actually get, can't, you know, um, pre-made frames for them if you, if you need to. Well, uh, uh, well, I have, a, I have a frame that this one came in. This was, this was a freebie mm -hmm. from, from a, from a yard sale. Yeah. Somebody was getting rid of, and so, but anyway, I looked. I looked this guy up, and this this particular painting is called Canal Venice Canals Number Two, mm -hmm. and he's asking two hundred and uh, on sale for two hundred ninety five dollars. So it's a bargain. Wow. Okay. <laughs> he's asking two ninety five for it for the Jaclays or not for the original? No, the, for the Jaclay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the print market. Is, is getting kind of silly right now. Uh, there's a lot of people who are actually uh, commanding some pretty hefty prices for prints of their work rather than the original. Um, and in fact, a lot of artists have moved to where they just don't sell the originals anymore. All they'll do is sell Chiclet, that's it. And uh, you know, that one keeps the price point down. And number two, um, you know, they, they retain the original art, so they don't lose it. So, you know, it's not a bad deal. Uh, it, that doesn't work with commissions, though, obviously. If you do a lot of that type of work, um, you know, people are wanting the original piece of art. So, plus it's kind of costly, you know, to, you're going to invest about three to $400 in, in getting a piece of artwork uh, digitized, scanned, color corrected, and then um, you know getting a, a decent print out of it. So, uh, so the process isn't really cheap. You know, of course, once you have the first one, then the rest of them are not very expensive. You know, you're looking depending on the size. You know, maybe anywhere from twenty to seventy or eighty dollars. You know, to get a print and uh, the Seventy or eighty dollars you clay off of a digital file that you've already produced uh, is usually around about maybe twenty four by thirty six. So you can get some big scale, larger scale type uh, paintings done. You know, once you uh, once you have that digital file put together. But so, if you're mass producing that, then you can make more money. At probably, I'm thinking on the G clays, and you can that original. That's why a lot of them do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, you know, plus, you know, the market is such right now that a lot of artists, you know, have basically their work on these sites, uh, like, what is it, uh, Art America? Yeah. And there's probably 20 or 30 sites out there that artists can put a portfolio together and, you know, people will come, they'll pick a painting, they'll pick the size, they'll pick the framing um, options and things, and they'll order it. And uh, they're ordering it actually not directly from you, but from that company. And that company will put it together and ship it and have it to them, usually within under two weeks, you know, complete. And, uh, and it's on demand. So it's not like the company is printing like a hundred, you know, of your pieces at various sizes. 
All they do is they just hold the digital file. That's it. And then, and then when they want to print it, they'll print it to whatever size format, you know, that is being requested. And in a lot of cases, they can take your work and not only put it on canvas, you know, they can put it on a t-shirt, they can put it on a mug, they can put it on a bag, they can put it on anything, really. And, uh, and you get a little royalty out of that, you know. Um, so a lot of artists are, are doing that. And it's, it's you know, you, know, you can get like residual, you know, income out of that over time. And, uh, you know, it's probably not a lot of money at any one particular time, but, you know, you add it up over a couple of years and, uh, you know, it makes it worthwhile to do something. <coughs> so, um, uh, uh, did, did, did anyone else just get knocked off Zoom? Or was it just me? I guess it was just you. <laughs> I, 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 I heard Bob <laughs> talking about a free canvas. And the next thing I, I uh, you guys were talking about digital money. I'm like, well, so I must have missed a lot. <laughs> okay. Well, um, what we were talking about, see, do you see the image of right. like, this Ven Venice Canal scene? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, Bob had gotten a canvas for free, you know, or not for free, but at a yard sale. Okay. It was free. It was all free. Oh, it was free. Okay. So it was free. And then um, I guess this was on a panel. And yes. he, he, puts oh, his, okay. he put canvas on the back side of it. And he started doing his painting assignment, this, on the oh. back side of that image. Okay. Oh, the plot picking. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But we, we got into this discussion about making your clay prints of your work and selling you know, mm -hmm. through different websites that, uh, you know, basically what they sell is jaclets of your work, okay? Okay. So that's what you missed, right? <laughs> Do you feel caught up now? Yeah. Okay, all right. All right, so we're, we're gonna move forward. Uh, I got some, uh, well, just, just before we started the class here, I got some good news in the email. Um, I had submitted, three pieces to the Atlanta Artist Center. And they've got a show that's gonna be up for about, uh, I think this is gonna be a fairly long show. I, th I think it's gonna be up through September. Um, and it's gonna start in July, like the beginning of uh, July. And it's, uh, I think it's Farm to Table is kind of the title of it. And they asked for people, you know, to do like themed pieces of, uh, you know, like landscape to farms and things like that. Well, I thought about it and, uh, you know, wasn't particularly inspired about doing either, uh, you know, food, you know, or, or still lives of food and or, um, you know, farm scenes. But you know, I've, I've been trying to experiment a little bit lately and try some new things over the last couple of years. And um, I hadn't really had a venue to show any of those pieces. And so I went ahead and uh, submitted those, even though they didn't really directly relate to this thing. And so I'm kind of surprised, one, that they accepted them. And I was really surprised that they accepted all three. And so the three pieces that I submitted was this piece, which you guys may be familiar with. I remember that, yes. Right. Okay. And uh, so this is a, actually a watercolor with uh, a metallic gold. Uh, it's called a metallic gold watercolor, but it's really more like gouache to me because it's pretty opaque. Uh, now, I did put about three layers of gold down, but it, it's like really, really metallic. Um, and then I drew over it with a fine line pen, you know, for the uh, background and the lettering and the graphics. Uh, so I submitted that piece. I submitted did, you hand, did you hand letter that? I did. Wow, I'm impressed. Yeah. Um, I did this piece 
And now this is yeah, yeah. This is a, a a bit of a larger piece. And again, you know, it was just kind of an experimental uh, piece. And uh, it, it was you showed us that when you first had three solid color balls up there. Right. Yes. And the moth yeah. wasn't there, the flower wasn't there, and the fish wasn't there. But I think. Yeah. Well. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff not there at that point. <laughs> and so yeah so so this is the the final on it and then um and then there was this piece which uh you know i thought was kind of fun and again it, it's it's a mixed media piece so this is actually a uh, a piece of clay that's been stamped this piece right here mm -hmm. uh, this is a piece of masonite that i put uh, gel medium on and then drew back through with a with a clay tool and um, you know made a, a texture or a pattern and then I I painted it um, you know built up you know paint layers on it and that's all applied to this background uh, which is all painted except for the areas where I had you know previously done a drawing of a couple of these animals and um, and this is actually a leaf that was collaged, yeah, you, that. you know, and it's, it's actually a real leaf that was collaged onto the piece with uh, gel medium and then sealed. And then I painted over that to bring out the texture and stuff. So uh, this, this, is a, this is a photo transfer. And again, that's an image that I picked up out of a magazine and then uh, transfer it on to just a clear piece of that acrylic uh, heavy gel, um, you know, and, and took off the paper on the back so it makes it transparent. Uh, so you can actually see the background through it. Uh, and then the same for the text. Um, the text, yeah, I'm, I'm still not happy with, but uh, if I ever did that again, I would probably use much larger and bolder text um uh, you know that real fine text just it didn't hold up you know very well so mm -hmm. so i ended up touching it up with a pen and you know, like i said i'm i'm not real happy about it but it still gets the message across so anyway those three got accepted into the show and uh, you know so i was happy to hear that it's something that i wouldn't normally uh show but, you know, it's, it's nice to get some kind of experimental work out there every once in a while, try new things and uh, get, you know, maybe some kind of reaction to it, see what people think uh, about it. And then uh, I think everybody's here that was here yesterday. Well, okay. Ah, there we go. Uh, I, th I think I went through this. And, and these were the yeah. steps mm -hmm. from the original uh session at that figure uh group down in columbus to the final you know, well it's not really final it's really to the dead paint stage and uh and i still have more paint to put on it but you can kind of see where it's going how it's developing right. so uh let's see moving on we got eloise um i think this is eloise's final okay and so, you know, she, she's been working on this a bit. She sanded this area around uh, the top of the head back so that the texture isn't quite so strong and not, you know, distracting anymore. You know, she's got uh, a pretty good likeness of, you know, the person that she was painting. I just have one comment about this, okay? And that is when I look, when I, when I look at the photograph of this woman, and then I look at your painting, um, I, I still don't think that you push, where's my cursor? There it is. I still don't think that you push the values down on this side of her face quite enough. And the other thing I would say is, you, you've kind of treated the mouth as almost like a straight line for us here. And you, if you could get a little more shape into it, she would have a little more expression. Uh, if you notice, you know, 
it, it's kind of curved and angled downward on the right side, and then it's you know mirrored on the left side. And so there's this downward curve on each side, and that's what kind of gives her this smiling, you know, um, you know, it's it's a very subtle, very slight smile to her face that you don't seem to have. I'm sure you do, but um, I don't think she'll object to it. She passed the day after Mother's Day, a hundred years old. Did she? I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, she never got to see it, so that's all right. So I'm gonna let it like it is but I understand I see what you're talking about I had a lot of problem with those lips uh -huh. I had a lot of problem with that so yeah yeah you know it would be um, you know just as a learning exercise mm -hmm. um, you know if you didn't you know if you didn't repaint the whole painting um, you could just work on like trying to paint her mouth and trying to get that expression, you know, or, you know, different parts like, you know, her eyes or her nose, um, you know, because there's there's some things in there that are pretty challenging in trying to get the uh, form and trying to see the form, um, you know, and the structure of the face and how the features actually sit on it. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, if, if you don't really want to commit to doing like a whole painting, Sometimes it's good just to practice, you know, painting mouths or noses or things like that. So you really begin to kind of get a sense of what the structure is underneath it. I can see some things that I do need to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the eyes also and the nose. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, there's, I mean, you've got a likeness of her, but there's something missing as far as sort of the emotion, you know, um, you know, in the painting versus the photograph. So mm -hmm. anyway. Thank so. you. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. We have Ilan. Yes, sir. And uh, so uh, this is, yeah, I think this is the new revised version uh, yeah. that Ilan did. And, um, you know, so it's this, this very, uh, you know, cute, perky little mermaid back here with her tail flapping. He's also enlarged, you know, the figure to the front. Let me see. Yeah, that's, that's the way it was before, right? And then- yeah, uh, I, I increased the, the lady, right. this lady in the bottom and right. this lady on the left uh, top. Right. It's totally new location and the size and everything. Right. Yeah. So, so that really brought her much further forward. And then in scale, uh, you know, it goes from her to her being the closest. And then after that, you kind of go to her because she's the kind of, well, really her and her are about equal in distance. Yeah. Level. And then that pushes her the furthest back. So, uh, so you know, at least now, now the scale of everything seems to make sense. And you know, you're beginning to get that uh, depth just by the use of you know trying to get those scales correct between the figures. Um, and that seemed to work out pretty well. So, that's very, cre very creative. Thank you and, very much, but yeah. I didn't put my, what bothers me is that I didn't put any paint on it. Well, I did a little walk in the it. middle. <laughs> I put in the middle a little bit uh, like uh, pencil ink, but nothing, it's not enough. Okay. Well, you can always add more. <laughs> I know I yeah. I'm still playing with it, but the the composition now looks good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't, then, I wouldn't change any of the figures, um, but you know, like softening transitions, like from here into here, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know do something a little more interesting. This this is kind of a hard vertical shape here. 
you know, yeah. that somehow. Uh, you know, same thing here. You know, try to blend this into yeah, yeah. You know, this a little bit more, and uh, and I think you'll be fine. So yeah, in general, uh, mm -hmm. just a, a little touch here and there. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to do a lot. It's just you know address those like those hard sharp edges. You know, so that these kind Thank of you. Blend, blend together a little bit better. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's it's just fun. I, I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's back to kindergarten. Okay. Uh -oh. Why not? You know, we're all looking to try to try to feel a little younger and all. Why not go back to kindergarten? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I. I I apologize, but I got to go. Oh, okay. Not to the kinder, not to the kindergarten, to a doctor. Okay. And I'll see you probably tomorrow. Okay, I hope so. All right. I hope everything Thank you. goes well. Yeah, this is uh, old stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, this is a. Uh, a watercolor jeans in it and uh, you know she's got her one lone tree out there and uh, so Jean tell us a little bit about that well I saw a picture of a tree uh, that I liked and I just uh, put, it in, put it in a little uh, I just wanted to really to knock knock you over with it and that's what it does with the single tree and the with the light Mm -hmm. Behind it, yeah. Just, uh, that's a, just a something. I guess another trial and error piece. Okay. <laughs> I had an idea for, it and that's what I did. I like that. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. There, Thank there's you. some nice things it's that really small, work. You, you said it's really small. How how small is it? I, I put on there what it was. I think it's uh, like. Uh, Seven by nine or something like that. It's bigger than a five by seven, but it's uh, it's not tremendous in size. I'm, it was a scrap piece of paper, that, that a piece of uh, watercolor paper, and it mm -hmm. was a smoother piece than I usually work on. I usually work on the, I like the uh, rough, the cold press rough, and this is was just a piece of paper I found in my art paper, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, and I just I, I just like to try it. Well, you know, you know, some of the best watercolors that have ever been done were done on small scrap of watercolor paper. Um, well, that's good to know because that's what I'm painting on now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they were they were done by a guy by the name of Winslow Homer, um, who uh, went out into the forest and woods. Um, you know, did some fly fishing, stuff like that, and uh, did a lot of watercolors, uh, you know, kind of capturing those scenes. And it's mm -hmm. amazing how little some of those pieces are. I mean, you know, they're probably, like I said, probably about five by seven, you know, maybe six by nine. Um, but they're incredibly uh, well organized and read, you know, really clearly, even when they're blown up um, and enlarged. They, they still, all the scale and everything else still works really, really well with it. Um, he's probably, he was probably one of the best uh, watercolorists that, you know, ever, ever used the medium. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he has some fantastic work. If you, if you haven't taken the time to look at, uh, you know, his watercolors, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, What's his name again? I write it down. Winslow. Winslow. Homer. Oh, Winslow Homer. I didn't, I heard the Winslow, but I didn't hear the Homer. Yeah. I know who that is. Yeah, I've seen a lot of his work. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Him, him and John Singer Sargent actually did, you know, uh, they both handled watercolor really, really well. And so you, you can't go wrong by looking at a lot of their work, um, you know, particularly if you, if you want to use water medium. Uh, they would be good examples. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
The sky is beautiful. How did you do that? I wet the paper and then I just put, uh, I had two different brushes going with the different blues on it. So it would be wet. I held the paper up and let it run. Oh. I have a question, Jean, about what type of brushes you and John, what type of brushes do you use, synthetic or animal hair brushes, to do your watercolors? Well, the watercolors, I use the, the uh, synthetic brushes or, or the, um, <laughs> I've had some brushes for about 30 years. They're very, uh, uh, very, very expensive brushes. <laughs> Uh, and, and they just don't wear out. They're, they're soft brush, and I can't think of what they are. So, um, and they're so, what's that? What are they? And they're synthetic brushes. No, this is not the uh, no. It's they not say, a so they're sable. Yeah, sable brushes. Thank you. Uh, uh, that was a, a sable. I have sable brushes, but I I have synthetic brushes that that uh, I I scrape with it so I can <laughs> have my sables for. Uh, different usages. Okay. And John, what kind of brushes do you use? Synthetic or the... Uh... Mine are synthetic, cheap <laughs> brushes. I've got some that are supposedly designated watercolor brushes that have a short handle, almost a pencil length. And then I also have some, uh, what did they designate as an oil paint brush with uh, big long handles and thicker, my bigger brushes. But they're all synthetic. Okay. So Charles, is there truly a difference between synthetic brushes for watercolor and oil and acrylic, or is a brush a brush? Uh, I would say that there is a difference, okay? And in fact, since we're talking about them, I'm gonna show you the difference in some of them. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna stop this momentarily. Okay. Um, can everybody see me? Yep. Yeah. Now okay. I see so, uh, Jean, now I'll see yeah. you again. Yeah. All right. So uh, this is the watercolor set. Now I bought this online, um, and then I added uh, some brushes to it. Uh, what came with this were these gray colored brushes, and these are all watercolor brushes, but they're all synthetic every one of them, okay? And for the most part, I mean, they work really well. Um, you know, they are they make synthetic brushes for watercolor and water media that are extremely soft. Uh, they're almost like a sable, but the cost of these are, you know, considerably less. Yes, the price. <laughs> yeah. Um, notice how small that brush is. Yeah, for what you use that, but it's, it's round and it's small, yeah. I'm sorry? For what do you use that kind of brush? Watercolor. Like to sign? No, no, for watercolor. You know, so, you know, when you're working with watercolor, you're, you're not in an easel and it's not sitting up vertically. Flat. It's usually either tipped back at, you know, a slight angle or, or perfectly flat. Um, and so, you know, the way you work with these brushes, they're short handle brushes, uh, you would kind of consider them designer brushes is, is the term. And designer brushes, the difference between that and easel brush is that with a, a designer brush, you're usually standing up and you're working over, you know, a, uh, a flat, you know, canvas or a flat piece of paper, okay? And it could be water media, it could be acrylic, it could be any number of things, right? Now, I also added to this set this little brush right here. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, now this is actually a. Uh, I want to say it's a mink hair brush, and it, it's a, a Japanese brush. Um, you know, I I picked it up online and ordered it. It was, a, it was probably about $20 for that brush, okay? But bar none, that's my very favorite brush up. <laughs> Just about any of those water media brushes. And the reason being that uh, it carries a lot of paint 
and it's got a, you know, when it's wet, it's got a very, very fine tip to it. So I can draw with it, but I can also, if I just put a little more pressure down on it, I can also make some very broad paint strokes with it as well. And, uh, you know, it's extremely soft, you know, um, you know, really, really, you know, really lovely brush. And, you know, it's just a, it's just a beautiful brush, you know, if you just look at the way that it's put together and constructed, it's really, really well made. So it was well worth, you know, the money that I spent on it. And uh, along with that, grab these. I'll take, I'll take this out of the plastic. Along with us, okay, I tend to use these, okay? Mm -hmm. Now this is a very traditional Japanese or Chinese brush. Again, you know, very long. This is not synthetic, this is a natural hair brush. And this is really good for like big washes and, you know, laying a lot of color down. Uh, you know, it's not good for, you know, doing any kind of detail. Even when you get it wet, it's, you know, it doesn't change shape very much. It's, it's fairly broad. Um, this is probably, again, you know, my, my second favorite watercolor brush. And again, you know, it's a, it's a Japanese brush. It's a, well, actually, no, it's not. It's a, it's an American brush. It's a Princeton. And it's a quill. Uh, again, it's a natural hair brush, but again, you know, you can, this carries tons of paint, you know, and you can use it again, you know, to fill in like a really broad area very quickly, or, you know, just less pressure on it. You can make a very, very fine line with it as well. So, uh, it's a very versatile brush. Uh, same Thing with this now this is a this is a synthetic uh, who made this I don't know who the manufacturer was you know I picked this up from the Nita and again it's a synthetic brush but it's really you know it's a, it's a round but it's a short handled designer brush and again you know it's a really versatile brush you know when when this is wet and you load it with paint you know, this looks very thick, but, you know, when it's wet, it tapers down to a very, very fine point. And again, so you can really carry a lot of paint or you can do, you know, very fine, uh, you know, drawing and line work with this as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where you don't, you don't have to go out and spend a ton of money. Uh, you know, on watercolor brushes and things. Uh, the main thing with any set of brushes that you get, regardless of whether you're working with watercolor, acrylics, or oil, um, is the shape and the size range, okay? And what most people do is they don't get big enough brushes. You know, they tend to buy a lot of small little brushes thinking that they're gonna sit there and do a little detail. And the fact is, you probably need to be buying bigger brushes. Um, you know, again, regardless of the media that you're working in. Uh, you know, because like in, a, in if you're working in an easel, you could have a number 12 or a number 16 flat brush, which is pretty broad. And, uh, you know, again, just getting used to how you manipulate that brush, you can get very fine lines out of it, or you can get very broad paint strokes. Um, if you get a number two flat, you can't do the same thing with it. You know, you might get that fine line or that small area, but you're not going to be able to get that big, broad, bold paint stroke out of it that you can out of a number 12 or a 16. Um, so, I'm not saying that little brushes are useless, uh, but they, sh you know, you should keep them kind of off to the side, you know, and use them 
at the very end of the painting. <laughs> you know, don't don't start out with you know, start out with the bigger brushes and, and kind of work your way, you know, down, you know, as you finish the painting, because, you know, I've, I've watched people do this for many many years, and you know, inevitably because they're not confident or not sure what they're going to do, they they want to start off with this little brush and then they kind of want to build it up, you know, fill in an area. And they'll take, you know, 10 times as long to do that painting than it should really take them to do because they're just not, you know, they're not working with a large enough tool and, and they could get there a lot more efficiently. And, uh, and in doing so, get a lot less fussy about it and make a much better and more interesting because the paint and the brush will work together better that way than if you try to fill in a big area with a, like I said, a number two brush. That's kind of silly, you know, because you're, you're working for hours and hours and hours, you know, to try to just fill in this one little shape with, with a brush like that. So, so brushes are important, but, you know, again, look for big brushes, not small, okay? Okay, thank you. That's very informative. Thank you, Charles. All right. Um, let's go back to looking at. So, so what you seem to be seeing is the size and the kind of brush you get is more important than synthet synthetic or uh, uh, um, natural bristles. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, depending on the media. Now, if you're working in watercolor, you want to get the softest brushes you can get. Right, uh, and they make synthetic brushes that are extremely soft. Yes. So, you know, and and they tend to be much cheaper yes. than a natural hair brush. Um, and and that's not going to stop you from doing a, a good watercolor if you don't have natural no. hair brushes. It's just not. Um, but yeah, just make sure that they're nice and soft. But again, you know, yeah, it's the size. You know, get bigger brushes not a lot of smaller brushes um, because you know if if you only had let's say you only had like six brushes right you know to do watercolor you're going to want something that's a good like inch and a half two inches wide you know uh, to fill in you know like big areas of color or put down big washes or just water to wet your canvas or your paper uh, to prepare it for painting on. Uh, you're going to want something that's, you know, a step down from that, that you could block in, you know, like big masses of color, and then maybe a step down from that that's a round uh, that comes to a point so that you can do both, you know, fill in big areas quickly and still use it and make finer lines with it. Um, and really, you know, you, you shouldn't need more than like one or two very small brushes, you know, out of those six. Oh, okay. So, you know, think of it this way. It, it's, it's, you're, you're buying the tools so that you can paint more efficiently. So, you know, so find those tools that will help you do that and bigger brushes will do it. Uh, and, and they'll keep you out of trouble because they'll stop you from getting caught up in details, you know, too soon in the painting as well. Okay. Anyway, we get, uh, I was going to say uh, a few things about Jean's tree here. Um, you know, she's got some really, really nice stuff going on here. And if you look at this, um, you've got a beautiful sky laid in. Um, and the sky feels very natural. Um, you know, toward the horizon line, it's more cloudy and more solid, and then it begins to break up as it goes over our head. And these little bits of blue popping through really help give you uh, the sense of cloud being over your head and you being able to see the sky through them. Um, and so it, the sky itself, you know, from the top down to the horizon line pushes backward. And, and begins to set up some depths, you know, in the painting. 
Uh, the same thing is true in the landscape, kind of the lower half of the painting. She's got, you know, larger, more textural shapes here in the foreground. It gets simplified as it moves back with her horizon line and this tree line. And then the tree line, you know, again, is kind of pulled together and generally a common value. Um, but it's got some color variation in it and it doesn't look flat. You know, it looks textural and layered and, you know, that adds some interest to it. I guess the only thing I would say is that, uh, you know, if you had not gotten quite so strong and so dark in that tree line back there, it would sit back even a little bit further, okay? Uh, because the contrast in value in some of this is as strong as what's in your tree. As the front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just, just maybe taking a little bit of water and right. laying on there, letting it sit for a minute and then taking a paper towel or your brush and just lifting back a little bit of it so it's not right. quite so strong will help give you a little more distance. Okay. 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 But I mean, the way, you know, overall, the way you handle the depth and things in, in the painting overall is really, really good. So, okay. Thank you. you know, this is kind of a six of one half dozen another. Right. You know, I mean, you could, you could go back and do it or you could just leave it and not worry about it. Um, as far as the tree goes, um, the way you handle the color and, you know, some of the warmer colors and things, uh -huh. You know, here in the top of the tree, and then it gets cooler and darker as it moves, you know, down, you know, down the, uh, the limbs right. of the tree. And, and that's, you handle that pretty nicely, and it kind of gives you this illusion of the sunlight hitting sort of that upper part of the tree right. and the lower part being in shape. So, you know, in many ways, you know, it helps create. Uh, a somewhat three-dimensional feel to the tree that you wouldn't have if you hadn't done that. And so that works pretty nicely. Um, as far as the trunk, again, you know, where you've got the warmer color in the leaves and the branches, um, you've repeated that in the trunk as it turns. And so you definitely get a sense of light, you know, hitting part of the trunk and then it falling back off into, you know, shadow in each direction. And so again, you know, it helps reinforce that idea that this is a three-dimensional form rather than just a, a flat shape. So again, you know, you you handle that really well, right? Um, really interesting tree. I, I hadn't seen one grow quite like that one. Yeah, I I've never seen one quite grow that way either. But you know, trees do some amazingly yeah. strange things. Uh, do. Yeah, they're Between really. Between the river and another tree laying on top of it, it can change mm -hmm. shape as it grows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Actually, I was. Where was I? Oh, hmm. no. I, I was at my house in Valley, and I, I took a walk back to the back of the property. I, I have two lots there, one in front of the other. And in the second lot, there's a very, very large oak tree. And it's literally growing probably eight to 10 inches from an equally large pine tree. Mm. And so the, the two of these trunks are going up and one of the branches from the pine tree at one point evidently crossed, you know, the oak tree or nice. in between two branches. And eventually the oak tree just basically enveloped that limb. And so now the pine tree, that limb is growing right through the middle of that oak tree. Wow. You know, and coming out the other side. Yeah, right. And it and it looks almost like the pine, like the pine branch is coming out of, you know, out of the oak tree. And that it's part of the oak tree, but it's not. It belongs to the tree on the other side of it. And it's just grown right through it. Um, so so yeah, trees can do very bizarre, weird things at times. Um, speaking of bizarre, weird, you know, uh, tree trunks and stuff like that. 
you've got this uh, painting of trees and you know it appears to be autumn you know because of the color in the leaves and things right. and then you know you've got kind of these nice almost silhouetted shapes of the tree trunks in here and again you know this is it, it's handled really nicely um, the one thing I would say though is that you, you come down to the edge of this hill and I'm reading this as fog or mist or something like that. Yeah. And the only, I guess, comment that I would have uh, to say about it is that if this could be a softer transition, you know, so it wasn't dark green and then all of a sudden it was, you know, this kind right. of light pinky gray. I should have had um, a little bit of the lighter green come through there. I think the one that's up on the hill. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like you could take a like little bit of this right. and just, you know, just right. barely kind of get some of this back in there so that again, it looks like that hill continues back there, but anything mm -hmm. in here is going to be much lighter even than that. Right. It's, it's just going to be this little slight tinge of green and then you would kind of get the illusion that you're looking through something foggy um, there. Uh, again, you know, the only only real issue I have with this whole painting is how abrupt that change is right there. Right there. But, you know, I thought it was too dark a green actually, but I, I just uh, didn't figure out what to put on it. I, I was going yeah. thinking about putting some like yellow ochre or something through there to uh, like it's in the tree and it's also in the, uh, the, the by the trunks on the left hand side. I was thinking about putting that some of that through there. Yeah. To, uh, but, yeah I, I don't know that I would go with the yellow ochre and I don't really think you have to do anything to this area. I mean, you could, you could like, again, you know, lay a little like water on there and mm -hmm. just sponge that little triangle back a little bit so that it begins to look a little softer, a little fuzzier and fade a little bit. Um, but I think another way of doing that is, again, is taking like a very light green wash like this, um, grain it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking about a very, very pale tint of green, you know, back in here. Right. Um, you know, again, just to sort of get the eye to like, okay, yeah, the, the hillside kind of continues and this is fog that I'm looking through. Um, and that's that's why it kind of goes through that. Mm -hmm. um, and that might help tie it together and soften yes. the transition a little bit better, okay? Yes. This one's just an eight by nine piece, eight, eight inches by nine inches, something like that. Just happened to be a piece of, uh, scrap paper I had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, little things like that, you know, you, you map them and you frame them and you know, they make really, really nice little gifts and little pieces of art. You know, not not all art has to be, you know, this huge stuff. Um, sometimes oh, some of the most exquisite yeah. stuff is pretty tiny. So. That uh, wasn't that dark, but that helped the uh, illusion of distance. Yeah. Right now, the water seems to be cut off and not really. Yeah, well, that's what we were saying. If, if she softened this back, yeah. you know, she could she could soften this back or she could put, put maybe just a very, very pale tint of green here so that it, it had some continuity and this didn't stop right here. It kind of just yeah. kind of faded back into you know this background. Um, either one would work. You know, there's certainly you know more than one way of tackling that. But you know, the issue here is that the change is too abrupt. Yeah. You know, between the two of them. All right. And it and it calls it calls too much attention to that area when yeah. Yeah. that's not really what you want to look at. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have June. Thank you. Uh, Miss June Wang. June, you here? Yes, I'm here. Yay. Okay. So this is the drawing that you, you had sent this drawing in last week, I think, right? This is yeah. a nice drawing. 
Yeah, it is. It's, it's, yeah. it's a very pretty drawing. Um, you know, she did a very nice job on it. Um, you know, I think the first time we looked at this, you know, my comment was you could try to soften some of the features in here a little bit and you could still, you could still work on that, you know, just tweak it back just a little bit because it's, it's still a little bit hard, but you know, she's, you know, she's got a very pleasant expression on her face. Um, kind of a nice gesture to her hand. She looks relaxed, you know, so really, you know, the drawing overall is, you know, really pretty nice and, and you know, kind of feels fairly natural. Um, then we go to this girl, <laughs> you know, and, and it looks like we're looking out our, our balcony window down to the street. And she's, you know, kind of moving through. And uh, yeah, it's it's got a nice, kind of forced perspective feel. Uh, the thing that's kind of odd is the size of the shoe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I feel this and uh, 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 the top of the, the leg is not right. I don't know how to do it. Well, actually the leg here doesn't uh -huh. bother me. It's just kind yeah. of the scale of the foot, you know. Uh -huh. Other leg, other leg. Oh, looks oh this right. leg? Well, you don't yeah. see it because it's covered yeah. by the dress. You do see yeah. where the shoe is. Yeah. And that's kind of what tells you that it's this kind of extreme foreshortening that's your way mm -hmm. of cover looking down. You know, I mean, there are instances, you know, when we were doing the life model uh, drawings and that you, uh, <clears throat> depending on the pose that they were in, you knew that she had a leg on the other side, but you couldn't okay. put the body Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's not that uncommon, you know, to have it happen. Um, here's your goat, and and hey. the same girl, and you know you got a pretty nice goat going on there. You know, it looks like a goat. You know, you got nice shape. You know, here in the muzzle and the nose, and you know you did a nice job with that. So thank you. Um, let's see, then we have, pardon me, um, we have this young lady. This was Julia Roberts, right? Yeah. I read, I read, I redid it. You redid it? Yeah. Okay. When you say you redid it, did you totally redraw it or did you? Redraw it. Oh, you redraw did? Redraw it, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because it, it's pretty similar to the first one you did. Mm -hmm. um, and you seem to make a lot of the same errors, you know, in this drawing that you did in the previous one then too. Uh, we talked about this strap, you know, or this, this, you know, moving around the shoulder and you've got this mm -hmm. moving around, but again, you flatten that out. See, that's gonna go over that shoulder as well. Kind of this direction. Yes. Yeah, instead of so straight. Um, you know, you, you did better with the teeth, you know, you've still gone back in and you've probably put a little more, um, a little bit too much of a pattern in with those teeth than you really, uh -huh. um, okay. you know, just the shape itself and maybe like one or two little hints of those lines are really all you need. <laughs> you don't have to draw each and every tooth. Okay. 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 And then kind of the same thing with the nose. Again, a little bit softer. Mm -hmm. no, uh, yeah. This is this is softer than what you had, but it can yes, go, not enough. <laughs> yeah, it, it could go a little bit softer. Okay. 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 Um, and you know that's that's a you know that's a really common problem because you know when you're drawing somebody, it's easy to sort of overstate a value or you know kind of bear down a little too much while you're putting in a line and make that mm -hmm. line too hard and crisp. And as soon as you do that, you know, you, you've you aged that person like 10 years. So you gotta be very careful with that, okay? Okay, all thank right. you. All right, well, that's, that's it. That's all I've got as far as things to share with you. 
from um, the work that people sent in. Um, we got about a. Hello. Sorry. Um, we've got a video um, that I'd like to play for you now. It's about 12 minutes. It's not real long. Um, but, you know, I think it's fairly valuable. This guy is talking about uh, doing like little studies, you know, outdoors, plein air. Um, and it applies to working in the studio as well. So, you know, I think it would be worth your, uh, worth your time to actually see it. So I'm going to, I'm going to share it. If you want to stick around for it, you know, I would encourage you to do that. And after that, then we'll wrap up the class and, uh, and go from there. <coughs> Anybody got anything to say? No. Okay. All right. Good. Then we'll get rocking and rolling. <laughs> there we go. All right. So uh, this guy's name is, uh, I think it's uh, John Crump. Yeah. Yeah, Crump. And he, uh, I think he's painting in New Zealand. Not all painting. Giving up all hope, really. But no, hang on, I'll not been here. one to mind. We want to catch this from desperate, the bit. desperate bit to get a this a decent sort of a painting. Giving up all hope, really. But not being one to mind, I'll just continue to silently feel miserable. <laughs> in the most magnificent place, place Taupo Bay, in, uh, well, very nearly at the very top of um, New Zealand. Beautiful spot, lovely day, and we're here to paint a series of little sketches just to show you how I, over the years, have got myself going. You know those times when you run out of inspiration and you, you think, oh, I need to be painting and I want to paint, but you can't find anything to paint and when you do try the paint won't flow and and you just feel out of sorts with the whole thing and yet you know darn well that you've done good pictures before and and uh well pictures that show growth and here you are going backwards as it were so i've found one of the ways i can get out of all that is to get out on the spot much better out outdoors uh, where you've got different uh, lights and shades and atmosphere all the time. It's constantly changing rather than being stuck in a studio. And I set myself a time limit for each little sketch. And I've done this quite a few times over the years. And often it's after you've had a layoff. And I've just had a long layoff, actually, after we shifted house and so on. And so I've needed to do this to get myself going again. Uh, I give myself usually about 20 minutes to half an hour maximum and I'll set up a couple of canvases like this. Sometimes I'll, I'll put a bigger one up and do four. And if I'm doing four, I'll, I'll perhaps give myself just 20 minutes a shot and really push. And when, when the, when the uh, time is up, the 20 minutes is up, then I stop. And it doesn't matter whether you're finished or not. You, you're trying to in, improve your mixing. The, the application of the paint, seeing the light and shade, uh, showing how you feel about it, trying to look expressive with your brush strokes, all those things are happening, but you're forcing yourself to do them as quickly as possible because you know you're gonna run out of time. And it's self-imposed, and you've gotta be strict on yourself. 
and, and uh, sort of not think, oh, blood, I'm enjoying this. I'll keep going. No, get on to the next one. Because ideas start to come. And I've often found after doing this, I might have four pictures on there. And I'll look at them and I'll think, well, the first two are, are rubbish, really. But you accept that because here you are trying to get started again. And uh, the third one shows slight improvement. And you look at the fourth one and you think, oh, it's starting to work. And uh, sometimes I've done that for two days. I remember one time in Coromandel when I did this and it took me two days to get going. But after that two days, I produced, I think, some of the best pictures I've done in my whole life. And uh, so I feel it works. And if it, if it works for you too, that'll be absolutely great. One of the things that I've found over the years that is uh, the urge to produce clean color has affected my palette. And I've done a lot of research, uh, seeing what other painters use and trying various colors. And I've discovered that there are some colors that help you to avoid mud and there are others that readily make mud. And so as I start now, I'll just show you around my palette. Um, so we start off with Winds of Blue. I'll run through this very, very quickly because I've done it before. Winds of Blue, Red Shade, Venetian Red, Winds of Green, Titanium White, and over here we've got Cadmium Lemon and Cadmium Yellow Pale, Gold Ochre, Cadmium Orange, Permanent Rose, Cadmium Red, which I hardly ever use, and Magenta. And these colours I've found are very pure. As you'll have noticed, there are a lot of them are cadmiums. And of course, they're very expensive. They're artist quality. I recommend that whether you're an amateur or a, a professional painter, you're better, better to use good color. It makes the world a difference. I always start with the darkest darks. And I'll explain why. Uh, gives you, it gives you a gauge. You know that that's the widest you'll get. And if you plonk in the darkest dark, that get, then gives you your full tonal range, and then you can work out more easily in between those two, the light and the dark. Now, by doing it in that different color, there's no confusion. I know which one I'm going with. Now, we're into reflections. Now, you'll remember that a dark will be slightly lighter in the reflection, and a light will be slightly darker. Did I say that right? A dark will be slightly lighter and a light will be slightly darker. In other words, water is not a perfect reflector, not like a mirror. It can be, on very odd occasions, I've seen it where you couldn't tell the difference between the light or the dark and what was being reflected. But usually there is a tonal difference. Now we've got to remember that, of course, the sky is going to, the, 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 the sand here and the sky all around is going to totally change the feel of that. So we'll put the sky in now, so that I can put the reflection from that lighter tone around the rock. You'll see I'm going flat out because I am trying to, even though uh, this is a demonstration, I am trying to live out what I was saying to you earlier. That it's, it's one way of getting yourself going again. If you've, had a, if you've had a layoff for any reason at all, you tend to find that you've Unless it's just been a short while, you'll find that you've slipped back with the weed. Sometimes it pays too when you, um, just clean that brush off, if, if you've plonked a few bits of, of rock under the surf site, just, just feather over them with that supposedly clean brush. To soft them off a wee bit. I, I, would like to, I would like to flick some water down through here, but my 20 minutes is up. So that's that. We're in a spot called Langs Beach, which is a little south of Wangarei in New Zealand. When I go looking for subjects to paint, I don't want to do photo representation. I want to do more than that. I want to convey some abstraction and design sense and all those sort of qualities so that it becomes a painting, not an attempt at 
extreme realism or anything like that. And so I'm going to show you now what I have in mind for this particular scene. So I'm going to reduce the size of this rock a little. It all fits. I don't, this, this is running out on this side. I'd rather keep this inside and show a wee bit of foam in there. Notice when I put the island in, I slashed it in quite quick, and now I am adjusting its shape slightly. And that's the easier way to do it. And there we have it. That's a good exercise. Notice I'm not trying to carefully paint those in, you know. If you're going to paint in an impressionistic manner, you don't want it then to start looking like an attempt at a photograph where it's all carefully done and perfectly positioned and all that sort of stuff. It's got to feel a wee bit as if you were free to do what you wanted. So, sometimes you can you can ruin a beaut effect that you had by, by starting to alter it to try and keep up with the changing light. And you shouldn't do that. This palette in the dark is too dark. Hard to see what I'm doing. And quite often you're, you're with somebody, and I can think of two occasions where this has happened. Uh, you're with somebody and they're whistling and singing and having a great old time and you're feeling absolutely desperate. And on two of those occasions that I can think of, um, the thought occurred to me, this, this painting is not, it's not the end of your life if it's a failure. So why don't you just throw a bit of paint on and see what happens and what do you know? But both of those paintings that I can think of, one of us mountain scene and going walkie, and one of a, a boatyard, boats from a boatyard up in uh, Littleton, and they turned out to be you. And I was all set to watch them off. And, and just throwing the paint on, reckless abandon, transformed them. So if you're feeling despondent, just get out there and give it a, give it a bash. It doesn't matter if it works or not. Next, next day or the day after, it may all come together for you. You start to feel back in the groove again. So that would be my advice for this little series that we've done, getting started again. Uh, just throw the paint on. Try and be expressive with it. Try and be broad, live at your time, and watch yourself grow. All the best. Keep at it. We'll see you again. All right. All right. There you go. That sounds like some good advice. It's oh, very yes. hard to understand. Hard to understand? Yes, because my, the, the, uh, it's unstable. My net is oh. unstable, and I'm getting, with his accent and on and off like it is, the most part I got was throw the paint on and, and good luck. <laughs> well, there you go. That kind of sized it up, you know. Yeah. yeah I, the thing is, yeah, get out there, you know, um, whether you're having a good day, bad day, doesn't matter, you know, uh, and actually take those those times when you think you're having a bad day and, uh, you know, just just start laying some color down, you know. Don't worry about it. Just have fun with it. Um, and a lot of times you'll find that, uh, you know, at the end of it, you like it a lot better <laughs> than if you yeah. had futs and worried with it. So, a little low for so long. Yeah. That's the but, difference between a big brush and a little brush. Yeah. Throw it on a little with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anyhow, that, that, I wanted to kind of play that for you guys because I, I thought that gave some, you know, pretty, uh, you know, Pretty good advice from somebody who's been painting for quite a long time and uh, you know hopefully that'll kind of stick in the back of your head so next time that you feel like you're hitting your head against the easel or something like that you can uh, you know just just let go a little bit and uh, you know throw some paint up there okay all right I see you made it Richard how you doing you're muted. Let's unmute Richard. Yep. 
Okay. Yeah, unmute. All right, Richard, talk to me. <laughs> I'm here. There we go. Okay. See, now I can hear you. Okay. You got any thoughts about anything that we uh, looked at today? I'm uh, just about back from a doctor. Yeah. He can't find anything wrong. Okay. Well, we knew that there was nothing really wrong with you. He's going to put, put me on physical therapy now. Okay. Starting in two weeks. Okay. So about two more weeks of being drunk. All right. Now this is this is for your uh, vertigo, right? He says his little bitty tumor up in there somewhere. It's huh. causing some problems, but he can't give much help. Okay. But anyhow, I rushed back to get you back with yours today, so here we are. All right. Okay. Well, hopefully, you know, you, you guys saw something today that will get you motivated. Maybe you'll go throw some paint down on a canvas or a piece of paper or something. Um, <laughs> T-shirt, your dog, you know, <laughs> your tabletop, you know, who knows. Um, and then, and then, of course, we can get together tomorrow and you can tell me all about it. Uh, tomorrow <laughs> is all about painting and, uh, you know, painting mixed media. And so I'm going to try to try to present a couple of artists who take a slightly different approach to painting than the traditional approach, mm -hmm. and uh, and we'll kind of look at them and talk about them. Okay. You're going to you gonna finish. You're going to finish up the video of uh, Richard Smith. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we have that to finish up too. Uh, okay. I stand that's, corrected. That, that's All right. Over an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna. Yeah, let's finish Richard. Let's give him his due, and maybe maybe we'll save these two uh, folks for next week. Okay. Gonna go. So, See you. Huh? Say what, Armando? He just left. He just uh, left. All right. Yeah, I guess he was saying goodbye. All right. So uh, at any rate, I guess uh, we will see you tomorrow at two, and we'll finish up Richard Schmidt and talk, uh, talk a little bit about him and uh, maybe take a look at a little more of his work if we have time. And uh, all right. So I hope you guys have a great night. You too. All right. Thank you. See you Thank tomorrow. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.